Green light go. Okay, guys. Let's bring it in. Are we ready? Okay, who is stressed about comps? When did they start feeling stressed about comps? Last year. Last year? <laughs> wow. <coughs> why, why are you stressed about comps? Yeah, what else? It's pass fail. Right? So there's a lot riding on this exam. There's a lot riding on it. It's a cumulative impact of two years of learning about different things, and it's all coming down to these two exams, three if you're a PhD, right? Okay, so, and you guys don't know what's on it, but you do, because this is kind of, this is material that you use every day, okay? It's really straightforward. Who's looked at the core concepts list? No? No one? Hands? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Okay. So everyone's really stressed, but we haven't started looking at the core concepts. And the idea of what Mauricio and I wanted to do by having these review sessions was to get you to start thinking and looking at the core concepts and how to prepare for these exams instead of doing it two to three weeks before they come up, like a lot of us did last year, myself included. Okay, So we thought that if we had it tiered throughout the semester, it would kind of jumpstart you into going, okay, now I kind of know, I know what's on it. And it becomes a lot less intimidating and a lot less awe-inspiring when you look at those core concepts because it breaks everything down that you need to know. So each of the review sessions are going to go through and pretty much follow and try to review as much of the core concepts from our perspective as we can. I need to put in a disclaimer. I do not know exactly what is on the test. I do not see the test, okay? I am not a professor. I do not have all the answers. But I'm creating a space for us to be able to talk about ideas related to assessment, questions that we have, and kind of try to battle some of that, that anxiety so you can be the most productive you can be. Fair enough? If I don't know something, I'll ask many. <laughs> If he doesn't know it, I'll go, oh shit, I'll Google it. I'll try to find out the answer for you, okay? But really it's just about helping you carve out time to start preparing throughout the semester because things catch up, this is second year, right? And you're going to be so burnt out by the time May comes, you're going to be like, oh, thank God that's finished. Oh wait, comps, what do I do? So we're kind of trying to circumnavigate that for you. Does that sound fair enough? Okay, so I thought before we start, does anyone kind of have any questions about what the comprehensive exam looks like, what I thought about the comprehensive, like the assessment or the ethics, but predominantly the assessment, and kind of thought we could use a little bit of time to dissuade any myths that anyone might have about it. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. What's the, do you know what the all-important <laughs> question. Oh, sorry, I have to repeat every question so it's microphoned. What is the passing percentage? Okay. Uh, okay, so it changes every year. I'm sure you guys have heard rumors about the fact that it's kind of can be quite low. So with the ethics one, it's standardized. I think that you have to get 75% on the ethics exam. Being 75% ethical is not bad, so I kind of agree with that principle. Um, the assessment one varies in that it's based on a bell curve and they curve, I guess they plot everyone's results and they have it so that that pass rate has a bit of variability in it. Last year the pass rate for the first, the June session of the assessment prelims was 24 out of 50. Which is less than half. A lot of people scored above 24 some people scored below 24, but it does vary. So you shouldn't operate on the assumption that you need 25 to pass. If everyone does really well, that pass rate can exceed 25. Uh, but historically, it's been lower. OK? Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, Larissa? Um, I heard some stuff about statistics being on this 
test, and I'm wondering, like, I have never heard anything about that before, so which, does that fall on the assessment part of the test? Or? Okay. So the question was um, the degree to which <coughs> statistics kind of present and show up on the assessment exam. Okay, what we're going to cover and look at today is uh, the ethics and when you look at the core concepts it breaks down each section. There is a section that looks at statistics, statistics related specifically to assessment. So we're going to cover a bit of that in the later part of the session today. Um, it looks at what we're going to cover is the different kinds of validity, what is validity and reliability, type 1 versus type 2 errors, uh, the normal distribution curve, t-scores, standard, standard deviations, means, uh, like classical test theory and observed scores versus true scores. So it's not like you're going to be asked to calculate a stepwise regression on your, on your assessment exam, but it's it is going to be on there. Um, in my experience, I don't really remember there being any, I don't know, do you remember many that there were any like statistic items on the assessment prelim? But there is, it does represent 10% of the exam. So if you have 50 questions, 10% is five questions. So there will be five questions that, that look at in some way statistical elements and properties of, of test construction and assessment. That's okay. Um, my advice, and I guess like when you look at the core concepts, it breaks down what each section is worth, and then you look at that as um, a representation of the 50 questions that make up the core, like the comprehensive exam, okay? So you might go, oh, well, I don't really need to know Rorschach because it's probably only going to be seven questions, and this is only going to be seven questions. But those things add up. Okay, so try not to disregard any one section by thinking, oh, well, if I don't know that too well, it's only worth this many questions. Because if you do that, you might spread yourself a little thin. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, Tara? What's the core, the core concepts to be? Sent that or where do we get that from? Uh, so where can you get the core concepts guide? It's actually on Moodle right now. Okay, um, so if you go into Moodle, I, you all have to enroll. Sorelli Patel would have sent you a link and you all have to enroll in the comprehensive exams class for Moodle, um, which will give you access to materials that we upload. So I already uploaded some Rorschach quick guide cheat sheet things um, that should be up there and you'll see the core concepts you can download it it's a word document okay um, and like I said it goes through it breaks down every single section so theoretically you shouldn't get out the exam and go oh my goodness I had no idea this was going to be on there theoretically it won't happen don't worry any other questions guys no? Did that dissuade any anxiety? Yes, many. So I have a question about the assessment exam. Do I have to learn all of the tests that are in the library? Do you have to learn all of the tests that are in the library? No, but, <laughs> the but. Everyone's assessment class looks a little different, right? You have the different flavors of different professors. You have certain professors who are going to favor more projective tests. I was in a class where I didn't learn a single projective test other than the Rorschach, because that's just the style of my professor. So I had to look at the core concepts and recognize that there were a, there were a list of tests, and they're all listed, um, that I had to go and expose myself to, because I wasn't given that in class. You also have to remember that your assessment class doesn't teach you for this exam, okay? Your psychodiagnostic assessment class is teaching you how to write psychodiagnostic reports and think psychodiagnostically using different measures. So there shouldn't be an expectation that everything that you need to know is going to be covered in your class. No. Otherwise it would need to be like five hours a week and no one wants that. Yeah. When like um, the tests are listed yeah. that you said are listed, you should mm -hmm. know these? What is the important thing to know about those tests? Okay, so when we, would you like me to bring up the core concepts? Yeah. Yes.
does everyone see where I've gone? assessment core concepts okay so it's a word document that you can download it goes through blah 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 um, gives you your overview and then it starts breaking down the different oh, sorry then it starts breaking down the different areas that you need okay so the first one is tests and measurement ie stats okay it breaks it down Reliability theory, assessing a test reliability, implications of low, oh, sorry, of low reliability for accuracy of measurement, okay, validity, characteristics of generalizability, cultural variables, validity of individual results, clinical judgment and inference, okay, and then it says the topics above represent approximately 10% of the items on the assessment exam. So like I said before, 10% of 50 is five, right? My math's not off. Paul's nodding, so it must be right. <laughs> okay, then it goes into the second section, the measurement of human intelligence, okay? The topics above represent approximately 20% of the items on the assessment exam. What's 20% of 50? Yeah. 10. Thanks, Paul. Knew I put you up the front for the reason. Okay. <laughs> Historical background. Definitions of intelligence. Ethnic, racial, SES, disability, and related issues with psychometric IQ measures. Wexler, obviously, the main dude that we learn about for three for two years. Waste and whisk profiles. Okay. Strengths and weaknesses, verbal versus performance differences, the different indexes, what different subtest patterns might look like. Okay, introductory knowledge. Okay, so understanding of the purpose of the test, what it measures, and the population it serves of other cognitive tests. So who got exposed to an IQ test other than the waste or the whisk? Did you administer it? Just, okay, so you just presented it, right? So there you go. Here's an example of what we learn in class isn't always going to serve our needs in terms of this exam, all right? So it says the Stanford Binet. It lists it, the Stanford Binet fourth edition, okay, which is another intelligence test, which we have in the library, but which no one uses for the purposes of intellectual assessment or psychodiagnostic assessment, okay? And culturally sensitive tests, the DAS. Who's heard of the DAS? Yeah, PSC people, right? Okay, the DAS, the differential ability scale, is another cognitive test. It's one that we don't really get exposed to in our classes. It's one that you have to have some awareness of for these tests, for this exam anyway. I'd recommend, just me personally, um, the TONY, the test of nonverbal intelligence, the leader, and the PPVT, okay? I had, well, I heard of the Tony, but I hadn't heard of a lot of those other ones before I started preparing for this exam. So it's looking at what it does differently. What are the ages, okay? What is the theory behind intelligence related to this test? All right, the DAS is gonna be a big one for you because it's related to other ethical elements of assessment that we'll go over today as well. But you kind of see what I mean in terms of you're going to need to really re review this core concepts form to really know what, what is expected. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Then it goes through. Next section. Objective personality, emotional functioning, and behavioral measurement. 
That's your MMPI2, your MMPIA, uh, the MCMI and the MACI, okay? And then a general knowledge or an introductory knowledge of other assessments, such as the 16PF, don't worry if you haven't heard about it yet, the CPI, which is the California Personality Inventory, the Beck Inventories, CBCL, and SCL90, okay? And they represent another 20%. Then we have projective tests. So, Rorschach, oh, fun, okay? The TAT, the CAT, the TMAS, the storytelling um, assessments, right? How, who's getting exposed to those in psychodiagnostic assessment? A lot of people, that's really great, okay? Like I said, I didn't get any of that, so I had to go and seek it out. So you, when you look at it, you want to kind of look at, okay, what's the difference between the cat, the team mass, and the Roberts? Okay, look for what makes each of those special. So, and we won't get into it too much, but all right, so the Roberts has three versions. It has the Latino slash Hispanic version, it has the African American version, and the Caucasian version, right? That's something that's special about it. It also pulls more for social roles and how people understand social relationships and interactions. The cat has two versions, the animal and the human, okay? So it's, you don't have to have administered these tests, you just need to know what parts, like what are the parts of them that make them special and useful in terms of assessment. Does everyone get me? Yeah, no, right? Okay, then brief introduction of neuropsychological and educational tests, okay? The TRAILS, which is a classic neuropsych measure. The BENDER, the VMI, and the Wexler Memory Scales. And then the educational assessment, which is the RAT, the Wyatt, the Woodcock-Johnson. What is it different about each of those? So the RAT's a really quick general screening measure. The rat has two versions, the green and the blue. Um, Woodcock Johnson has norms for post-college, like for the post-college population, okay? What parts of those make them different from one another? You want to look at what are the unique attributes of each test, because that's probably what's going to be asked about them, right? Like a question might be, oh, well, um, Let's go back to like the, okay, and they represent 10%, so there's five questions related to those. And then the ethics, which are worth 15%. So that's the core concepts guide. What's it like to see it? Feel better? Less stressed? More in control? Yeah. Um, so on there, I think said the Wyatt too. Are there any questions about specific versions of each test or It'll be the most, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to repeat the question. Uh, so it said the Wyatt 2, it should say the Wyatt 3. Okay. Um, typo. Uh, so will there be different versions of tests? Assume that you need to be aware of the most current version of the test, okay? You're not going to be asked questions about the WACE 3. You're going to be asked questions about the WACE 4. Okay? You're going to be asked questions about the most current use because, as we'll find out when we review the ethics of assessment, it is our ethical responsibility to use the most current appropriate version of each test. So they're not going to make you chart the differences in all of the wastes, different waste versions throughout history. They're just going to want to know that you really understand and can use the waste for, which is the one that we're working with now. Does that answer? And if I don't answer a question properly, anyone, just let me know, because I'm learning too. So this is the core concepts list, okay? It's right there. Everything is spelled out. Everything is broken down. So without being too much of an OCD um, freako, oh, and I bought my flashcards for everyone to show you just how sickly you can get if you don't regulate yourself. <laughs> color-coordinated flashcards. Um, 
is to download and print off the core concepts, okay? And you just start going through it piece by piece, all right? You're gonna still be learning a lot of material in the next few weeks of class. Class isn't finished yet. But you guys know intellectual measures. You've already done that. You did, a, you did a semester of that in your first year. You know different theories of intelligence, or you can go and start reviewing those and start making notes on them, okay? So another hint of advice, you will see a lot of people, oh, hey, <laughs> don't touch. <laughs> I don't know how to fix it. Okay, so flashcards. All right, last year people became really obsessive about flashcards, as you can see. I had a little case for mine and thought that if I made them and they were all colored for different sections that I would somehow magically know the answers. Right, hey. So, <laughs> you gonna come and help me? Oh, okay, ooh. <laughs> They're flashcards, they're to help people study. Yeah. You can keep that one. Or do you want a pink one? Pink one. There we go. Rorschach. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, guys. I digress. Let's get back to being serious. Yes, many. Oh, okay, yeah, good idea. Where does it go? You hold on to that. Okay, guys. So I can pass them around. All right. And you can look at how sick I got. Okay, so this is how but basically, okay, you'll see a lot of people walking around with a set of flashcards that will keep growing. And my advice to you, everyone learns differently, we know that. I happen to be someone who needs to write things down. I just need to write things down to get them. But it's more the act of making the flashcards than it is actually having the flashcards. And I know that sounds really basic to say, but it needs to be repeated sometimes because people go, oh, well, I'll try to get a set of flashcards from someone who did it last year. And I mean, if you want to come up, I'm also an assessment tutor, so if you want to come and talk to me and have access to look at my flashcards, you're more than welcome. But I really recommend making your own because it's the process of making them. Ooh! <laughs> Ooh! No, let's not touch that. It's like a scary TV, okay? Is that okay? I like your sparkly shoes. Okay? It's the act of making them. That's, that's the best advice I can. Oh, thank you. You're a good helper. You're a really good helper. Okay, so it's the act of making the flashcards. That's the best advice I can give you because it's a way of kind of encoding the information and getting it down. If you work differently and you type out notes, that's cool. It's just about finding a method that works. <laughs> oh, oh. Cancel. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Okay, it's about finding a method that works well for you. But I don't want you to. Let's not press that button, okay? Can you come and hold my hand? No. No? Okay. Oh, no. Adelaide, say goodbye. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <gasps> I didn't do well with little people. <laughs> Bye, Ali. 
That was stressful for me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. So, but do you know what I mean? And it's about really preparing because there's nothing worse than having it be two weeks before the exam and thinking, oh my God, now I've got to make all these flashcards and I'm, I'm just trying to give you all the most advice and help I can so that you don't get to that point because that's when you get stressed and that's when you get freaked out and overwhelmed and it's just not worth it. This exam is not worth that much stress. If you prepare and you're consistent and you review the core concepts, you should be more than fine. So how's everyone feel about that? Ready for some ethics of assessment? Can I ask a quick question? Yes. So maybe you went over this, I missed the first few minutes, but how early do you recommend actually starting to make the cards? And I mean, obviously we have a review session now, but how early do you recommend starting to study? Okay, how early do I recommend starting to study? Okay. It's like... It's never too early, but there's also like within the realms of what's, you know, possible given that we're full-time students. It's like you always want to do all the reading, but sometimes all the reading just doesn't happen, right? Uh, I recommend, um, what I don't recommend is waiting until about two weeks before. Okay, so what happened last year is Dr. Michaels and Dr. Chan... Dr. Chang did a, a statistics review and Dr. Michaels did two assessment reviews and Dr. Taub did an ethics um, review and they happened probably 10 days before the exams from memory, okay? But they were very frightening because you had every single G2 student or moderated G3 student in this room panicking because no one had started being pumped with a lot of information that they knew but thought they didn't know. Mm -hmm. So you just had a lot of anxiety, okay? That didn't really help anyone because it just made people go, oh my God, I don't know this and I don't know this and it just, but it triggered people to start cramming, which is what a lot of us did last year. So I don't recommend that. I don't recommend waiting for those review sessions to be your signal to start cramming down the information because there's a lot. And apart from the fact that you want to pass the exam, and I won't, don't want to get too future oriented for you because it's on the license exam, but that may as well be in 30 years now because of everything that we have to accomplish between now and then. Um, but it's actually really exciting in a nerdy way, but we're all nerds because we're in a doctoral program, to be able to understand the material really well and to have a sense of self-confidence related to that. Like, unfortunately, I didn't understand the raw shark until after the exam because it forced me to really break it down and study the pieces and I'd only ever learnt enough to kind of like balance everything out and get through everything else and write my assessment report about it. And so it felt really cool given that I was going to school to learn how to be a psychologist and these tests happen to be the thing that psychologists have ownership over, that I could understand it to the degree that I did. Like, so it's actually a confidence enhancing process if you kind of start to really look at it. And it does get exciting. Or maybe it just did for me. But you know, I would watch Law and Order episodes with my two-point MMPI codes and go, <laughs> I actually literally did, because I got that tired of studying. I'm like, oh, okay, so the serial rapist from this episode looks like this code type, <laughs> right? Because it helped me kind of build an image. But then I also thought, wow, I'm actually learning how to think psychodiagnostically about a person and how to understand their behavior and apply different tests to come to conclusions. And it made me really appreciate it. And so if you start working consistently, mm -hmm. like I would say, well, what is it now? It's March. Mm -hmm. I would say if you got through what you needed to do and if, if, you wanted, if you want me to give you a timeline and you thought, okay, I have April and May and then it's at the beginning of June. And so I'm gonna start making my notes in April. I'm going to start working on it eight weeks before, right? And I'll start covering the sections that I already know. So I'll start looking at the ethics of assessment because I've been doing ethics and that's kind of straightforward. And I'll look at an overview of human intelligence and the different kind of ways 
like the different kinds of intellectual measures because I've already been exposed to all of that and I know it really well. You're taking the pressure and the burden off the the um, the other end, which is Rorschach and MMPI, which you still might try it be understanding in your classes at a deeper level. Does that make sense? Like I wouldn't recommend going and making your Rorschach notes now because a lot of you are still learning about it in class and some of you haven't even gotten to like the purpose of the Rorschach yet. So it's going through the core concepts and looking at what makes like logical sense to start kind of reviewing earlier and looking at those. Because it still takes time to memorize waste and whisk and different things. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay, cool. Paul. My, my TA um, recommended, she said, don't, don't really start until spring break. So I felt kind of... Uh, yeah, that's the first week of April, right? Yeah. yeah. So I figured like, that was kind of a... When you think, oh, you have spring break, you have a little bit of free time to maybe look over stuff. You won't use spring break to look yeah. over this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you kidding? I'd like to. I thought I would do that too, and I did it. Um, so yeah, so that that's a really good suggestion. So Paul said that his TA recommended after spring break, right? You have that recharge and then you get back into it. And that's what I'd kind of recommend because trying to cram everything in two weeks before the, like, because you finish classes and you have, I think, like 12 days between when you finish classes and when the review, like when the exams are. I don't recommend that because you're going to be burnt out and exhausted and you're not going to want to spend 10 hours a day studying this stuff. So if you start doing a bit of prep work, you take the burden off, even though I know the concept of delay and denial is very tempting. No more questions? Is everyone feeling a little less anxious and stressed? We've ripped the band-aid off, right? Yes, okay, so we're going to start off with um, the ethics of assessment and I apologize guys, I thought that the first session too would just be about kind of addressing these issues with you and quelling anxieties and a lot of questions because the ethics of assessment is kind of straightforward and a bit dry um, and each of, the, each of the review sessions that we've designed are going to go through the different core concepts sections. But I also want to have a bit of flexibility because I wouldn't know, I didn't know if you would have looked at the core concepts and I just wanted to meet you all where you were at. So each week we're going to go through different aspects. So I don't know if you've looked at the email, but next week Mauricio is going to start looking at the different theories of human intelligence at Whisk and Waste and how to really understand those. I don't know the degree to which he'll expose you to the other tests, but that whole time will be dedicated to that. We're going to have two for MMPI. Um, and the other, uh, the other objective measures, and then the, we're going to have one for Rorschach. And so today, the plan is to look at the ethics of assessment. Like I said, it's really straightforward. Okay, and yes, many. What if a student can't come to a session, a review session? Oh, if a student can't come to a review session, they're all being filmed. Oh, do you want me to put it up here, Greg? That would be great. Okay. Phobia of microphones and being recorded, and it's like very confrontational. Okay, um, so all the sessions are recorded. Okay, all the materials because we'll have handouts as we go to. I'm going to upload those, and you also have the like Mauricio and I who are doing these presentations are also the assessment tutors. So if you can't make one, or there's an area of the core concepts that you feel you need more support on than others. You guys can use the resources that you have available, which is making an appointment with one of us. And you can have individual reviews or small group reviews if you want to coordinate with friends. Okay? We have five hours, well, some of us have ongoing appointments, but we have at least three hours each a week and can be flexible, or at least I know that I can in terms of if your availability doesn't match mine. So if you want to do that, I really recommend doing that, okay? But right now we're going to go over the ethics of assessment. 